Well, welcome everybody on this uh, Mother's Day weekend, and to all of the mothers, God has given you a gift and a trust that lasts for a lifetime. Who you are and what you do matters more than could ever be put a value on. Uh, your strength gives strength to your children, and may God bless you in all that you do and in all that you are. We're following on these weekends uh, the story of Christ's words spoken from the cross, and we've saved for today the word that our Lord Jesus Christ spoke to His mother. And I'd like to invite you to jo turn to John chapter 19 and verse 25 through verse 27, where we find these words spoken by Jesus. John chapter 19 and verses 25 through 27 if you turn with me there. And we read there that near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. And when Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved, that is John who is writing the gospel, referred to as the disciple Jesus loved, so where Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, dear woman, here is your son, and to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Now, that's where we're headed today, but I want to take a few moments to remind you on this Mother's Day weekend of Mary's story. I have a very simple outline, a mother's joy, a mother's anxiety, and a mother's salvation. So, everyone should be able to follow that quite easily. We begin with a mother's joy. Who can describe the joy to a mother in the birth of a child? This amazing miracle that God would bring a new life into the world through you. And anticipating the birth of her child, uh, Mary composed one of the most beautiful songs that was ever written. We know it as the Magnificat, and she sang these words. She said, my soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, because He has been mindful of the humble state of His servant. And so, this is a day to thank God for this uh, amazing gift and for the sheer joys of being a mother. What an amazing gift of God that He should use you to bring new life into the world, that this miracle of forming a new life, this work of God should have taken place in you. For Mary, of course, this was quite unique. She was a virgin. The angel appeared to her and said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. And here through her is the miracle of the incarnation, that God Almighty takes human flesh, that the Son of God, think about this, is born of a woman that Mary gives birth to Jesus and wraps Him in cloths and lays Him in a manger. No wonder the Holy Spirit moved Elizabeth to say to Mary, blessed are you among women, and then she said, blessed is the child that you will bear, the joy of a mother. Secondly, a mother's anxiety. The birth of a child brings great joy. Raising a child brings great anxiety. I think every mother would agree with that uh, today. Now, you may think about this. You may have thought, or maybe even said, if I had a perfect child, I wouldn't have anything to worry about. Well, think about this. Mary had the perfect child. And yet, as you read the story, it is quite clear that the pressures upon her in the uh, work of mothering must have been very great and substantial indeed. Let me give you uh, just four snapshots of a mother's anxiety, even with the perfect child. 
Um, the first is the story of Simeon that we have in Luke chapter 2. It started, you know, when Jesus was just eight days old. They took him to the temple, and this godly man, Simeon, took Jesus in his arms and pronounced a blessing over the Savior. And then he said to Mary, now this child, he said, is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel. He's going to be spoken against, and through him the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. And he said, a sword will pierce your soul too. That was the first indication of what it would mean to Mary to be the mother of our Lord Jesus Christ. Twelve years later, as we read in the Scriptures a few moments ago, Mary and Joseph are back in Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. There are multiple families, relatives, friends, all traveling as a group down the road to Jerusalem. And when they're traveling back, you know what, 12 years old, that's middle school, right? Middle school students like to be with their friends. And so, the family assumes that uh, Jesus is with the other students. But when they look for Him, they find that He is not there. They go back to Jerusalem, and there He is sitting in the temple. He's asking questions. He's answering the priests. And Mary says, your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. That's why I used the word anxiety. She uses it. I've been anxious, she says. been worried. There's no parenting without anxiety, is there? No parenting, no mothering without anxiety. You move on into the ministry of the Lord Jesus, and uh, because Jesus traveled around to so many different locations, there must have been many times, many incidents in the Gospels where Mary was not actually present. But for sure, when Jesus was in His hometown reading the Scriptures in the synagogue, as Luke records in chapter 4 at the beginning of His gospel, for sure, in the hometown synagogue, Mary must have been there. And Luke tells us about that day. You may recall it, how Jesus took the scroll and He opened it, and He read the words of Isaiah the prophet, "'The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners, recovery of sight to the blind,' and so forth. And then Jesus rolls up the scroll, and He says, "'Today, this prophecy of the Messiah has been fulfilled in your hearing.'" And you read on in Luke's account, and the people, uh, and Luke tells us all the people were furious, not glad, they were furious at Jesus. And so furious were they in his hometown that Luke tells us that they got up, they drove him out of the town, and they took him to the brow of a hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. That, that's, that's some reception in your hometown, isn't it? And it's very interesting. Uh, Jesus walked through the crowd. His time had not yet come. Uh, they did not take His life, as you know. But you very rarely read of Jesus ever being in Nazareth again after that, only a very few times. But Mary was there. It was her hometown. What was it like for her to live there in a town that so decisively reviled and rejected her son from the very beginning. And then you may remember the story that Mark records when Jesus entered a, a house and there was a huge crowd again that had gathered as so often where our Lord Jesus was ministering. And it says that the crowd was so great, pressing in on the house, that Jesus and the disciples were not even able to eat. They couldn't get out the house. They're just the constant demands of people. And you can guarantee that a mother's always going to get anxious if she thinks her son's not getting enough to eat, right? And uh, so, so Mary turns up out on the scene, and uh, here is this godly woman, and she loves her son, and she sees that he's missing his meals, and uh, he's missing his sleep too. We know that from other scriptures, and she's becoming anxious about him as any mother would. So Mary comes to the house. And they send in to Jesus, and they say, now, your, your mother and your brothers, uh, they're outside here. And then Mary hears him say this to the crowd who are sitting around him in the house. Jesus says, who are my brothers, and who is my mother? Who is my mother? He looks at the people, Mark tells us, sitting around him, and he says, here are my mother and my sisters and my brothers, whoever does God's will is my mother, my sister, and my brother. 
Now, what did Mary think when she heard him say these words? In some way, her unique, beautiful, marvelous relationship with him in some way was going to end. Uh, there's going to be a new family, and it's not going to be built around Mary. It's going to be built around Jesus. And it won't be a family of people who are made one in the flesh. It's going to be a family of people who are made one in the Spirit, made one in Jesus, by Jesus, in order to do the will of the Father. So, you look at the experience of Mary in the Gospels, and you see not only the joy of a mother, but you see the anxiety of a mother. And you, you look at what she experienced, Now I ask the question, what then sustained her through all these burdens? and all these pressures, and all these anxieties, and all these perplexities. And I suggest to you simply this one thing. She is sustained through all the pressures of being a mother because she has seen the glory of Jesus. Remember, John opens his account of the ministry of Jesus with the story of the wedding at Cana. And remember how they ran out of wine. And Mary brings the problem to Jesus, and then she says to the servants, now, whatever He tells you to do, you just go and do it. And Jesus turned water into wine, and John says this was the first of His miraculous signs, and thus He revealed His glory. Mary saw it. The glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there's something here for every mother facing anxiety and pressure today. What will sustain you? through the pressures, through the anxieties that you face as a mother. And here's what we learn surely from the story of Mary. Seeing Christ's glory, knowing that this Savior is able to do all things, and He's for you, and He's with you. A mother's joy, a mother's anxiety. But here's the thing I really want to get to today, and I hope you will now have your Bible open at John and chapter 19. I want you to see here a mother's salvation, a mother's salvation. Notice verse 25 as we take up the story, near the cross of Jesus stood His mother, verse 25. Now, don't you find it very striking, guys? Take note of this, with the exception of John, all of the disciples had forsaken Jesus. They'd all fled. They'd all gone. They'd all run away. And with the exception of John, who do you find that loves Jesus around the cross? Answer, four women. They're named here. Mary, the mother of Jesus, is named first. Then her sister, then this woman, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and fourthly, Mary Magdalene. Can you picture the scene? Here is Jesus now on the cross, and together with John, there are four women, and they are watching, and they are no doubt weeping, and they are waiting, and they are worshiping. And this is the devotion that is being offered to Jesus uh, as they are surrounded by the hatred and the ridicule and the mocking and the spitting and the taunting of a Christ-rejecting world. Now, none of us surely can ever enter into what it meant for Mary, the mother of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who bore Him into the world to see Him suffer in His flesh as He did on the cross there. What did that mean to her? Erwin Lutzer has an especially beautiful passage on this in his book, On the Cross. He says, she who had planted kisses on the brow of that little child now saw the same brow crowned with thorns. She who had held those little hands as he learned to walk now saw those same hands pierced with nails. 
She who had cradled him in her arms now saw him writhing alone, his arms stretched out on a garbage dump in Jerusalem. She who loved him at birth came to love him even more in death. Simeon's words had indeed come true. A sword was piercing Mary's soul too. Now, we're following the story of what happened at the cross, and at this moment we come to what happened as it related particularly to the mother of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we have seen that the Lord Jesus was on the cross for three hours before the darkness came at noon. Three hours. And during these three hours on the cross, until the darkness came at noon, the Lord Jesus spoke only three times, just three sentences spoken in three whole hours. Now, you think about that. Three sentences in three hours. That is a massive amount of silence. The rest of the time, the four women and then John watching, waiting, crowds mocking, and not a word from the lips of Jesus. So, when He breaks His silence, there is so much attention. He's, he's saying something. He's saying something. The cross is lifted up, and He speaks the first time. Father, He lifts up His head. Father, He's speaking up. Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. Silence. Maybe an hour passes, and every minute seems like an hour. And then there's some words from this thief over on the other side, and Jesus turns to the side. He's going, he's going, he's going to speak. And he says, today you will be with me in paradise. Then silence. On and on and on and on. And then having looked up and then having looked to the side, he looks down. And he speaks a third sentence in three hours. Can you imagine, Mary? there's a word He's going to speak to me. All of the silence. What was it that led Jesus to speak to His mother at this particular moment, as opposed to any other time during these long three hours? It was the nailing that led Him to say, Father, forgive them. It was the thief on the cross that led him to say, um, today you will be with me in paradise. What led him at this moment to speak to his mother? Chuck Swindoll points out that Jesus spoke to his mother when the soldiers had cast lots for the robe. Look at that if you have your Bible open in verse 23 and 24. It's what goes immediately before. They had taken the rest of Jesus' clothes and they had divided them, just, you know, four piles. But then when they saw that the robe was seamless, it had been beautifully, beautifully woven, they, they decided that they would cast lots. Why would you tear a seamless robe? One of us should have it. Let's cast lots, they say. And Swindoll asks this very simple and provocative and helpful question. He says, who do you think wove the robe? Who would have made such a beautiful garment for our Lord and Savior? And then Swindoll asks this question. I, I quote from him. Uh, he says, why now? Why is Jesus speaking to her now? She's been there all along. She's been watching. She's been weeping. Why now? Could it be because of the seamless tunic, asks Swindoll. I think so, he says. 
when they touched the tunic, they touched something very near to his heart, the garment made for him by his mother. I think he may be right. There's our Savior in agony, but he's aware enough to know what is going on, and out comes the tunic, and out come the lots, and they're gambling, and they're laughing, and they touch the robe, his robe. And he looks down at his mother, and there's love, and there's compassion, and there is the most tender moment of connection between them an understanding that is unique to the two of them. And he speaks. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. Now, friends, what is Jesus saying here? How could John possibly replace Jesus? I mean, it is the kindness of Christ, and this point is often made, it is the kindness of Jesus to provide for the care of His mother, yes. John can care for Mary, and John tells us that he did, but, but John can never take the place of Jesus. So, why does Jesus say, here is your son? Some of you have experienced the irreplaceable loss of a child. To say to a mother who loses a child while there are other children or there can be other children completely fails to grasp the unique bond between a mother and the child to whom she has given birth. In the birth of, Mary, uh, of Jesus, Mary has discovered indescribable joy. Now, in His suffering and His imminent death, she feels and experiences an irreplaceable loss. John can never take the place of Jesus. Everyone knows that. So, there is something more that is going on here than Jesus providing for the future care of His mother. There's more than that here. Dear woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. Think about this with me. It is so important. The relationship between Jesus and Mary is changing right here. For 33 years, Jesus has been the Son of Mary according to the flesh, but as you know, He was also the Son of God. He assumed human flesh, which He took from His mother, so that He could become our Redeemer. This is why He came into the world, and this is why He is now hanging on the cross. Now, on the cross, the blood is draining from His body. The life is ebbing away from His flesh. The old order is minute by minute and hour by hour passing away. The relationship between Mary and Jesus is changing. And as she stands at the foot of the cross in her grief and in her sorrow, she must have been thinking to herself, oh, my son, my son, my son, my son, my son. And Jesus says, no, no. Woman, behold your son, indicating John. You are no longer to think of me as your son. Behold your son. John is to take that place. Regard him as your son. Well, then, how is she to regard Jesus? Answer, as her Savior and as her Lord. You see, when the angel told Mary about this child to be born, what was her first reaction? She said, my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. 
She had always looked to God to be her Savior. So how was God going to save her? Answer, Jesus goes to the cross, and He lays down this life in the flesh that He has drawn from Mary. His body is broken, and His blood is poured out. Mary's son dies, and in His death, He becomes her Savior. So, I want you to understand what was happening here. It is beautiful when you see it. There at the cross, Mary loses an irreplaceable son, and she gains an incomparable Savior. That is what is happening at the heart of this third word in the cross. And friends, when you see that, you will immediately realize that her gain was far greater than her loss. She, she lost the love of a son who was taken from her in death, but she gained the love of a Savior who death could never take from her. She lost the joys of a son who brought her great happiness on earth, but she gained the joys of a Savior at whose right hand in heaven there are pleasures forevermore. She, she gave life to him in the flesh for a time, but now he, she, he gives life to her in the Spirit for all eternity. At the cross, she loses an irreplaceable son, but at the cross through his death, she gains an incomparable Savior. And I say, therefore, her gain was greater by far than her loss. Friends, being a mother is a great gift, but it is not the greatest gift. Having a godly mother is a wonderful gift, but it is not the greatest gift. Here at the cross, something beautiful, wonderful, and glorious is exchanged for something of infinitely higher value. My great question for you today is not simply, are you a mother? But what do you know about a mother's salvation? Well, you know a mother's joy. You know a mother's anxiety. But what do you know about what Mary entered into here as this Savior dies and is her Savior? That's the question for us today. That's the issue that really matters. What is ultimately defining is not whether you are a mother, not whether you are anxious in the work that you are doing, but whether you have entered into what Mary discovers here. You see, roll the story of history forward a couple of thousand years to catch up to where we are here today and what's been happening in the intervening period. Mary has been in heaven now for nearly 2,000 years. And if she could come here and speak to us today, I am absolutely convinced she would say something like this. She would say, the life that He gave to me is greater by far than the life I gave to Him. I think she might quote this scripture. She might say, flesh gives birth to flesh, but spirit, the spirit gives birth to spirit. By the flesh, Mary's life was in Jesus, but by the spirit, Jesus' life was in her. Jesus said on one occasion, the flesh counts for nothing, and Mary's joy lies not in the life she gave to Jesus, but in the life that Jesus gave to her. You know that life? Mary would say to us, I am sure, I was so privileged to have this unique relationship with Him in the flesh, but that changed at the cross. Right there in His agony, He made it quite clear that John was taking his place as far as that was concerned. The flesh passes away. And I entered into heaven not because Jesus is my Son, but because Jesus is my Savior. Not because He is mine by birth, but because I am His by faith. Friends, do you see the glory of this? Because for all the uniqueness of Mary, this relationship that was defining for her is open to you. 
You know a mother's joy. You know a mother's anxiety. But what do you know about a mother's salvation? One illustration, then we're through. You may have heard about a certain wedding that took place in a very small country about 4,000 miles just over a week ago. What a marvelous occasion that was as uh, Prince William was joined in marriage to Kate Middleton. Um, on the day of the wedding, uh, the London Times led with a piece on the front page entitled, To Marry Her Prince. And uh, they describe in that article how, and I quote, this private tale of love has captured the imagination of people from Delhi to Dallas. And it goes on in that vein. Let me quote to you a few words. One couple, one moment, and the whole world watching. William, Arthur, Philip, Louis Windsor of Wales. That is a mouthful to get through, isn't it? I mean, that is a lot to remember for taking a vow. He will marry Catherine Elizabeth Middleton at 11 this morning in the presence of his grandmother, Her Majesty the Queen. One of them was born to take his place in the history books. The other a girl who was destined to lead a life of peaceful anonymity until fate and he stepped in. And then this. She wakes up today in a London hotel, Kate Middleton, girl about town. She goes to sleep tonight in Buckingham Palace, a princess of the realm. That's beautiful. Here is a girl born a commoner, but by union with a prince, she becomes part of a royal household. No wonder that captures the imagination of people from Dallas to Delhi. She did not get there by birth. She got there through union with a prince. Luther says, Faith unites the soul to Jesus Christ as a bride is united with her bridegroom. Faith unites you to Jesus Christ so that you share his life. And the reason that he took our flesh born of the Virgin Mary is so that you should share his life for all eternity. And you won't get there by anything that is in you by birth. You will only get there by union with this prince, this king, this savior. And so Mary got there. Not by the flesh, but by union through the spirit. And that invitation to be one with him is his invitation to you. He says this, the son gives life to whomever he is pleased to give it. And I tell you, whoever you are by birth or by nature, Jesus Christ invites you to come to him today. And on this Mother's Day weekend, he is pleased to give that life to you. Let us pray together, shall we? Father, we marvel that life eternal that a place in the royal household of eternity should be offered to us commoners, sinners, through Jesus Christ at his infinite cost and for our infinite good and blessing. We thank you that our eternity is not defined by what we are through birth. So much of life in many ways is shaped by that. But we thank you for a Savior who cuts through all of that and with love says, come to me and is ready to embrace us as we come to him. Lord Jesus, may there be many mothers who, knowing the joy and the anxiety of motherhood, find a mother's salvation today in Jesus Christ through faith. 
and those who are not yet mothers and those who never will be mothers and all of us men. Father, in Christ, let us find life eternal. And these things we ask in the Savior's name.